Oh
Bye. 
Hey, Hello. David. How are you? Okay. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, hey. Happy. Happy to do it. Ah, uh, it's awesome. And and just based on your last email, I'm sorry to hear about your loss of your good friend Sonny Osborne. And yeah, just want to send along my condolences. I'm sure in well, the in that industry or your particular genre, it must be a huge deal because obviously it's not a massive sort of mainstream thing so it really is yeah he i mean just one of the one of the uh would you call it the cornerstone people oh. in in that music you know if you were to make a list of 10 bands they would be definitely within the 10 probably within the, the first three wow uh, of important people yeah oh interesting but, okay. uh, we all i mean the whole the whole community at large lost him but i, I I, like a few other people, actually did get to know him and, and spend some time with him. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, but he was, he was, um, he'd had a couple of strokes. It was not completely unexpected, you know, <clears throat> but still.
<laughs> yeah, no doubt. And again, sorry for your loss. Yeah. Sending my condolences yeah. to you and the entire community. Sure. Um, right. And obviously, you know, healing is a big part of this process, which is what music is for as well. Um, so sure. again, thank you so much, Sandy, for taking the time today. It's been awesome over Pleasure. the last, you know, year-ish. You know, you're first sending me an email about pitch and you know just sort of our relate towards the show i uploaded on my youtube channel uh oh, okay. you randomly sent me an email saying the pitch is wrong on this we need to make an oh, adjustment the, oh you mean the the musical pitch yes correct and oh, like it was too fast I forgot. that's okay I, I'm yeah. never mind. and uh, so that sort of started this entire you know relationship at least for me i mean yeah. you know in you and your connection to jerry and sort of what i do it's just mm. been amazing that because you kind of reached out to me initially for something that you had a concern with. And then, you know, from there, you know, we've exchanged emails over the year or so, whatever, during the pandemic. And mm -hmm. it's been fun. It's been interesting for me because again, I mean, I'm a nice Jewish boy from Toronto and mm -hmm. you, you know, you're originally a nice Jewish boy from Miami. And, and it was just that, uh, you know, more or, less, more or less from Oakland, but originally Miami. Yeah. Fair yeah. yeah. And so yeah. just, you know, initially that's just really cool. And the connection of Jerry and whatnot. So, um, I start most of my conversations off and I call them conversations because I don't really like, I'm not an interviewer. I would rather just talk, yeah. and, you know, let's shoot the conversation. Shit, is good. Fun. Exactly. Conversation, conversation is good. And yeah. just, you know, conversation is spelled with a K A H N as in John conversation. That's a good one. I like that. I try to always bring, we try to, in the community online, we try to bring, we call them conisms. And that's, my, that, that's extremely good in his case too, because he was, if you knew much about him or knew him at all, he was an extremely voluble conversationalist, you know, conversationalist. There he you was go. Great, great, one so, of the funniest, one of the funniest guys you could ever meet. You know? ah, I wish I had. And, and it's interesting because yeah. he was also adopted by a Jewish family. Look at that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He was, uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote, as please. you used to call it. Oh, we're not on yet? No, we're on. Oh, Go, okay. please, okay. please. We've been on uh, since you got on, sir. Uh, John was, um, Marilyn Monroe was John's babysitter. Yeah, yes. You've heard that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's actually interesting because when I spoke with Dennis the very first time, uh, hmm. actually before that actual conversation, Dennis and I chatted a few times about some other projects, and right. it came up, and he mentioned that, I think it was 1978, that JGB tour specifically where yeah. Jerry was sort of like playing marriage counselor and Jerry called it the marriage counseling tour because you had Con and Maria and, and, and Donna and Keith sort of having some, not, not marital issues, but you know, and they kept going to Jerry with their issues. And I found that to be a really <laughs> kind of funny little anecdote about that, about, you know, all of a sudden Jerry's yeah. the guy, but now he's the marriage counselor because he, <laughs> you know, he's, he's in the middle of everybody. And I just found that to be really funny. That's pretty funny. I hadn't heard that. But he, he was a counselor kind of a person because he was a mediator per, kind of a, you know, he, he could mediate anything, basically, you know. That's he was a good person to get advice from. And, yeah, you know. well, we're going we're gonna to dive that in a few minutes. But I, I, yeah. I, I always ask people the same question initially because I do kind of have sure. a format and that I really stick to it sometimes. Sure. But That's right. Have you ever been to a Grateful Dead show? Yes. And what was yeah. okay? So, what was your first show, and how was that experience oh. for you? Regardless of you know your history, just you know, depending upon the year, it could have been a whole weird experience. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, it's very hard for me to remember the first show. Um, At ah, ballpark, gosh, yeah. you know, I, I went to a <laughs> I went to a couple things that were real early on, like one of those Golden Gate Park things, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um, but a show inside show might have been. First one might have been Henry Kaiser Christmas of um, 77 or 8. Ah, so you got to, right, we're in the good years, right, when everything was Oh, yeah. Off. I didn't know that at the time, you know. I mean, they were all, this, it was all the same to me. The, th the thing about me and the Grateful Dead music is that I I really, I've, I've, I've never really knew much about it. I used to go, if I was at those shows, for, for one thing, I hardly ever went out in the audience. I usually could get backstage and I would sure. get position myself behind somewhere near Jerry's amp because I was just, I was just, I was a Jerry head, you know? Yeah. I was, I was just tuned into, uh, I wanted to hear everything he was doing real clear. And I often did that to the expense of really learning what song they were playing. You know, everybody else knew by the second note, everybody around me knew, uh, you know, certainly everybody in the audience and everybody I know who's a deadhead now or a collector, they they can recognize the song in one note, one note or two, right? Yeah. Which 
like I can do with bluegrass recordings pretty much a lot of, of course them. but <laughs> but but this those are recordings this is live but um, but I was sort of blissfully unaware of what the songs were really all about and it's only been in it's really been since after Jerry's passing that I've gotten into it and really and tried to listen a lot and learn a lot and I'm I'm to be honest with you completely blown away by how for one thing, all the all the deadhead people know this stuff, and it's complex music. It's not simple, easy stuff, you know. And I'm blown away by that because I've spent my whole life on simple, easy stuff, basically, you know, musically, pretty easy stuff, really, compared to Grateful Dead music. Sure. So I'm, 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 I'm learning a whole lot, and I've been, you know, I have a friend who's a collector. He's probably got well, I'm not probably. He's Rick Young. He's got every show. He's got the wall. I mean, he's got the vault. In his house and has for many years and he's been turning me on to stuff if i go over there and visit you know i'll have to say because he's picked out something great to play and i'll say is that so does that sound like 77 maybe he'll and he'll have the date you know he'll know yeah, exactly what of course. It is. <laughs> that's and, awesome uh, and, and for thank you for saying that part because that's a good segue for that's sort of why in a way i created jerry church i mean well where jerry church evolved or came from was Everyone knows the Grateful Dead. Everyone is so engulfed in that. And they, like you said, they can call it. I mean, that's part of the fun of going to a show is trying to call the next song when you hear it or even before right. it even starts. I mean, that's part of the fun. And you yeah. get it right. You're excited. You get it wrong. Who cares? You just move on and you enjoy it. But I knew there was so much Jerry stuff potential that people didn't know about and, and, and hadn't heard. And to your yeah. point about being, we call ourselves Jerryholics on my channel because you know we're just so engulfed and so enamored with you right. know his ability to bend strings and bend notes and bend emotion in, in, in either a very a quick moment or a slow moment whatever it may be and that's sort of you know when i started doing this i didn't know i was ever going to speak to people i mean dennis just kind of came mm. out of nowhere he mm. originally wanted me to speak with donna and it didn't work out so i said hey how about you and then from there it just kind of kept going and you know speaking with merle's son tony was yeah. really enlightening because again he's been there as a child growing up in it so totally different perspective and that made me kind of think you know what maybe i need to go not i always say i can't go to jerry directly um but i need to you know i want to skirt those edges and hear the story of real people um but that's yeah. exactly it but outside of that i want to get more on you for a minute um mm -hmm. about you know sort of like what drew you to bluegrass you know i know you know i know you mandolin dober and banjo mostly but where, where did that initial, more, you can tell me, absolutely. I mean, very no. limited information I could find online, but what drew you to that genre, to that, you know, to that music per, per se? You know, that's always a hard question. It kind of goes to what you were saying at the very beginning. How did a nice Jewish boy from Oakland get started playing Appalachian music? Or, or for that matter, Garcia, you know? I mean, what, but he was into, he was really into it way much earlier than me. And and not only into it, but into the roots of it more. He played, he was an expert at old time music before he even got into bluegrass, you know, which wasn't true for me. Um, and my first thing was guitar, by the way. And I, I started on guitar. And uh, that's what I always played with Jerry. Um, but uh, the answer to that question is a tough one. You know, back in those days, the whole, the whole thing going on, as you know, all around the country, there were these little pockets of folk communities folk mm -hmm. music people you know and all that i mean palo alto had theirs that's about a little less than 50 miles from where i was in, in berkeley or Oakland. so and then berkeley had its folk scene san francisco and then you know los angeles um portland oregon seattle and then across the country you know and every and there were these pockets everywhere so the pocket i was in was the berkeley one basically and, and i was looking at folk folk stuff basically and blues you know, uh, Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry were here all the mm -hmm. time. Jesse Fuller lived in Oakland. And I, I went to visit him when I was about 14. One time I was a big Jesse Fuller fan. I still am totally crazy about Jesse Fuller. And most people don't even know Jesse Fuller. They know Deadheads do because of a couple of songs. Yes. And the world actually does, but they don't know it because everybody knows San Francisco Bay Blues, usually by uh, Paul McCartney or Bob Dylan or somebody like that. That's Jesse's song, you know, and, and I was really into that and into this and that and pockets of this and blues and folk. And, and I gradually started hearing stuff that was more country oriented or more Appalachian old time oriented. Uh, there was a shop in Berkeley called The Barrel. Barry Olivier had this shop called The Barrel, which later became Campus Music Shop. Campbell Code took it over and that's where I met Jerry in, in Campus Music Shop. But, um, 
Campbell was an important person because he had he had bluegrass records in the shop, and I mm. bought my first bluegrass records there. You know, and he was into he was more of a country and western and jazz guitar player, but he knew all about bluegrass, and he he would turn me on to things. And and then Jerry, when I met after I met Jerry, he turned me on to Jerry was the ultimate turner on or of everybody of everything. You know, here listen to this, you know, and and all that. And he was he had been fed by a guy named Brooks Otis, who was in Palo Alto, at, in those days named, called Adams Otis, which was his middle name. And Brooks, uh, Brooks was the main feeder of bluegrass to Jerry. Brooks had been in the service with Roland White, who was part of the, uh, what later became the Kentucky Colonels, a oh. pretty important band for Jerry in, in particular. Um, and, and Brooks knew a whole lot and he, he was turning Jerry on. Jerry knew Jerry would just, you know, gobble everything up, of course. And he was already, already had, he and Marsh Lester, you know the name? Yeah. Um, yep. had, had already, you know, explored a lot of old time music, a whole lot of mountain stuff, you know, and, and guitar, banjo and fiddle and everything. Jerry played fiddle. I mean, if you know that. Or not. Yes. But, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Briefly, I, mean, I didn't know enough about it, but I mean, that, that got you to helpfully bridge that gap. And, 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 and that's a good segue because I mean, that's the point. I mean, you. I mean, you mentioned in the email, obviously, with the Osborne brothers, and that was one of the first, you know, things you saw with Jerry in your car trip, which I'd love Leifert. to hear. Yeah, the first. Yeah, I love, I love to hear Leifert. more about that. But oh, also, yeah, well, that's a long story. They were the first thing we saw. Yeah. But I also know you played bluegrass with Garcia and David Nelson, the Black Mountain Boys, in '64. So, right. which kind of came first? Was it more you guys were already playing the music, or was it still kind of exploratory with Jerry, like you said in that car trip kind of thing? Where was that kind of evolution at that point? Oh, yeah. No, we were already way into it by the time we took the car trip. Yeah. Um, they were, they'd been way into it before I, you know, I wasn't even aware of, you know, even it's, it's only 44 miles down there to Palo Alto, but I didn't know what was going on down there, you know. Uh, I heard Jerry, on, there was this KPFA radio, Midnight Special, you've heard of that? Yeah. I think Phil Lesh had something to do with that a lot in the early days. Um, I, heard, I think I heard Jerry there the first time. But he was, I think he was playing 12 string guitar, you know, this guy had never saw him. And, uh, and he may, have, he told me once he may have heard me and Rick Shubb there. He may have heard, uh, we, we heard him, he heard us on the radio, but we hadn't met yet, you know. But, but yes, the answer to your question, we're all the way fully into, had dived deeply into. But what the reason for the trip was that we, see, I had gone, I'd gone east the year before. Um, Drove out to Indiana with a guy who was in a band here and was in Berkeley's uh, one bluegrass band, the Redwood Canyon Ramblers. Very hard to say more than once. Uh, <laughs> uh, hard to say once. Yeah. Uh, Maine Smith and I drove. He he was at school at uh, Indiana University, IU there, which is you know just like um, less than fifty miles from Bean Blossom, from Bill Monroe's Park, Country Music Park, in a little town called Bean Blossom. This is before there were any festivals. And um, so I'd already been there and done that whole thing in, in, in 63, the year before. But at the same time, I'd love, I'd love to hear your early experiences. I mean, hearing, you know, your, your roots and how you started and then eventually how, you know, Jerry got into the picture and that relationship. I mean, that's sort of what I was asking about was like, you know, ask about your first few experiences with Jerry, like both personally and musically. Like, right. what was the first time you guys played together? Like, what was that like sort of thing? And what are any yeah. stories you may have about Jerry in general, just his wonderful personality and whatnot? Oh, yeah, all that. Um, actually, I'd, I've never really quite remembered if we played that day that he came into, he and, he and Nelson actually were together, and they came into the campus music shop. See, they had, just to go back a little bit further, they yeah. had already, they had, the Black Mountain Boys were already going, right? I didn't know anything about it. They were, they were playing. Eric Thompson was their guitar player. Eric Thompson is a guy, he's still around here. He used to lives in Berkeley. He and Eric and Susie, and the, I don't know if you mm -hmm. know who, yeah. Eric, Eric and Susie have a, they play Cajun, they play all kinds of stuff. They're very popular uh, players, old time and some bluegrass. And uh, so what happened is that Eric had, had uh, kind of quit the band or just left because he was following a girlfriend and he was, went to the East Coast in the, and uh, chasing this girl. And, uh, um, sorry. and Jerry and David walked into a campus music shop where I was working. Um, she was probably in, it could have been late 63. I don't know whether Heather was already born yet or not. She was born in December of 63. 
And they may have come in there, it might have been right around New Year's time, because there was that, I mean, she was born and he was kind of at home with that. But then we, by the time we did decide to take, take the trip, it was only um, May. So she, you know, anyway, so he was, he was around, they were playing, they had been playing Black Mountain Boys with Eric at, they were playing it, you know, you know, Jerry's uh, regular venue, the uh, Top of the Tangent. Yeah. Where he, so they were playing at the Tangent, so I heard later, I didn't know anything about all this until I met them, you know, and he, they walked into the shop and they said, we lost our guitar player, we heard you're, you're a bluegrass guitar player, we want you to join our band. Or it was more like you're gonna join her. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that more actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just yeah, and uh, yeah, you're gonna be our new guitar. But anyway, so so I started. Uh, I don't remember whether we actually played any that day. We must have played a few tunes in the shop there. I just don't know. I don't remember. The only thing is, I don't remember. I have a pretty clear memory of them walking in, and I don't remember them hefting their instruments. Now, there were a few instruments on the wall. Campbell's shop, uh, Campbell's music shop was not like Lundberg's. You've probably heard of Lundberg's, yeah. where Bob Weir, I mean, a lot of people, you know, Lundberg's is a shop where all these wonderful um, 1920s, 30s instruments were just like lining the walls. Campbell's music shop wasn't like that. He had a few spare, sparse instruments around, some electric guitars, some stuff related more to country music, because he was kind of a country guy. But there, were, he may, there may have been a banjo in the shop that I, I don't recall us playing that day. In fact, how did he? How did Jerry and David know I could fill that role? I think it was from listening to us on on KPFA radio. I think that's what it was. And I asked Jerry about that. Oh yeah, I heard you and Rick. Yeah, and I was playing guitar then. And Rick was the banjo player. And uh, basically, we were, you know, basically what was happening is they were trying to steal me from from the Pine Ridge Ramblers, and that wasn't hard to do, because after I heard, I, I went down to Palo Alto, I think for the first time, I took the Greyhound bus down there, and I, I ended up taking the Greyhound bus down there like every weekend for a long time after that. But the very first time, you know, I had my, brought my guitar with me, and Jerry had his banjo, and Jerry was, as you know, all over the banjo, right? I yeah. mean, you couldn't stop him, he was unstoppable, you know? The people with, in the Haight-Ashbury, when they had that house, they used to say, yeah, that banjo was, right about at my ear level at jerry's height you know he wore his banjo a little bit high too and that banjo because some people wear him kind of low you know he wore yeah. his banjo a little bit high and he would say you know i think it was right in my ear all the time will you stop that you know and, and he would he was just playing all the time just he didn't stop he was just when he got into the banjo he got into it really heavily and he just i'm sure he played it all the time just like he played the guitar all the time later because he had yeah. played the guitar before but then when he got back into guitar he played it a lot, you know, I mean, practicing playing all day long. You know? So he was, so he, there he was in Palo Alto playing that incredible banjo and me and David and I don't know, we just started being the band. I, I think the first time we actually played was um, at Jerry's house in the living room, in, in, you know, with the baby there, and Sarah. And then there was a gig at the Tangent. The first one came up that I played and then it just went from there, you know. But I think I've jumped ahead of some of the things you asked. No, um, there's no jumping ahead. You're great. Right. We're just <laughs> I love yeah. it all. There's yeah. no I don't know, there's an order, but that doesn't matter. And thank you. Well, this is this is interesting. This is great. And I, I want to hear this, Roots, because maybe people don't know that. And you know, and this mm -hmm. is, you know, the real, the real stories, you know, like your yeah. history and how you met and you know, I mean, I, I question that my wife and she's my co-producer on this and whatever that means. I'm not mm -hmm. really a producer and neither are we. We just she helps me do the research and ask me questions to do the work. And I say Jerry this. You know, she, in your opinion, I mean obviously Jerry was so otherworldly that with everything he did. What do you believe? I mean, about the banjo or about bluegrass specifically, maybe what do you think Jerry loved about it the most? Like, you know, as you said, like he never left put the banjo down. So I'm not a big, uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with the banjo in the same way I'm with a guitar or other instruments, but in your opinion, like, what do you think Jerry loves so much about it for yourself? Well, in a way, well, in, in a way, it's, in a way, it's the same question you asked before, which was, how did you guys, you, you were referring to me, but how did you guys get into this stuff, yeah. you know? And then secondarily, why the banjo? Well, banjo, you know, as far as, as far as the first question, why did we get in, I, um, I don't know. There's, there, it's funny. Some people, some of those people who really were in heavily into what what is often called old time music, you know, which is a 
not a very good, not a very accurate expression because old time music can mean hockey oh, yeah. piano, all kinds of people call it old time music. Yeah, you know? for sure. So, but, it, but that Appalachian, that based in Virginia, I hate to mention Virginia right now, but anyway, based in, <laughs> based in a round peak area of Virginia up in the mountains, and there are these, there's a few communities there that nurtured a tremendous amount of music. Um, and, and Jerry and Marsh and a few other people got really into that. And other people, well, Marsh is an example. Other people who got really into that didn't particularly take the bluegrass route. They kind of stuck with what they loved in the beginning, you know. Why do you, why do you veer off, you know, and I was into Roscoe Holcomb and Jesse Fuller and blues and um, old time singers, Appalachian singers. Now, why didn't I just stick with that? Why did, when I heard what happened, I went to uh, 1961, Flatt and Scruggs came to Berkeley. They played at the Poly Ballroom up on the campus. Rick and I went to that, Rick Shubb and I went to that. We wore little string ties. We dressed up just like them, which is crazy, you know, and hats, <laughs> string ties. And, and brought an album to have Earl Scruggs sign, you know, and uh, that that show just totally blew my mind. I, I it wasn't that I didn't still love the old stuff that I started with, and I'm sure that would be true for Jerry too, you know. As a matter of fact, when we to jump way ahead, when we had the re when we had the uh, reconnection and we had the Jerry Garcia acoustic band, a lot of the a lot of the songs we decided to do were from his early repertoire from Mississippi John Hurt and from Elizabeth Cotton and you know and not bluegrass tunes specifically we we made we made a point of not being bluegrass we talked about it you know let's not okay let's not really use the banjo let's we we'll used a little bit of banjo but let's just do old stuff you know so he went back to that and people often do go back to but but I when I was 17 16 17 or even no actually I was more like 14 or 15 when I first got into it. I was, I, it just hit me really hard. And the banjo has a way of, um, with bluegrass people, there's, there's just some people who, I mean, there's a lot of them who go for the fiddle and I wish I had because I, I really love fiddling. And I would often say I would trade everything I can do. If I could play the fiddle overnight, and didn't have to work at it, I would give up everything else wow. just to be able to do it because I like it that well, but you can't do that. It's just, yeah. It requires, a violin is probably the hardest instrument in the world. It's just difficult. It's physically, physically uh, torturing and you have to get past all that. And then there's the music part of it. it is, but <clears throat> some people, some people just get bitten by the bug of the banjo. Some, Butch Waller, for example, my friend Butch plays mandolin. Right. He got bit by the, by the mandolin, you know. I don't think he ever wanted to play banjo, but some personalities, some people, I don't know, it's loud. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Yeah. Girls like, girls like it. I don't know. <laughs> well, funny you mention yeah. that, because I mean, I've only ever played one string instrument in my life, and it was the yeah. viola. Oh, yeah. And that's because when I was that age, I was tall and big, and they're like, you can't use the violin. It's too short for you. Your hands are too big. Oh, so they gave me the viola. viola. And yeah. up here, we had like a contest, like a Kiwanis festival kind of thing, whatever that means. And we came in second. And I never could read the music. I always had to write the G or the C above, and I couldn't really do the fingers properly. So I used, I figured out how to use one finger and slide it lower and down. And hey. so it was kind of cool. And that's like really my only ever experience was. was that's great. You were, Jan, you were Django on the on the violin. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah Django was, used two fingers. Yeah. Django used two fingers. Yeah. Actually, so two, and he was able to use the the two that were frozen too a little bit. But anyway. Yeah, actually playing a lot of, a lot of, this is a real digression, but a lot of the gypsy players, modern day gypsy guitar players have reverted, have, a lot of them are playing like Django. They're, they're realizing that to get that sound, you, you need to use one finger to get an, uh, an arpeggio like that. Wow. You know, if you use all your fingers, you're not going to get that sound. So, so I was ahead of myself, but I had no idea what I was doing. You were yeah, definitely I'm, ahead of your time. I'm, very much <laughs> an, I'm an efficiency person. I, I can't do it. Like if I show you, I can't do it. So I like, uh -huh. how can I make this? Oh, if you move it down the string, it has the same sound. And there so, you, you know, I figured yeah. that out and writing the notes above. So it was kind of cool. So <laughs> look, in a small yeah. nutshell, I can relate like this much, but well, just kind of cool that I can share that little bit of my experience with you. And, you know, you're, 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 you're uh, a professional's take on it. That's kind of cool for me, actually. You probably know that there's, there's a million banjo jokes. Banjo jokes are a dime a dozen, right? But I've been told that the viola, is the one that gets the jokes in the classical world. Did you know that? No, I did not know if you, that. If you maybe didn't stay with it long enough. I've, <laughs> I've been told that the, the viola is the banjo of uh, 
of chamber music, you know. Interesting. Well, you're a viola player, huh? So, yeah, yeah, I did not. Ah, <laughs> I didn't know. Oh, so maybe it was like grade school, like grade three, four, five. Maybe that was it. And uh, I never uh, picked it up ever again. But yeah, because you know, you're in music class. You got to do something. You got to have an instrument. And they, you're, you're too tall. Take this one. And I'm okay. And I was like the only viola player, I believe, at the time. I love the cello. I love the bass. I love the lower was, register. But the viola was kind yeah. of in between because we didn't have the A string or the E, but we had the G, right? So we had yeah. the high, but not as much of a more low, but not as high. So that was very fascinating for me too. And again, this well, was, wow. Well, we, we, we were similar. I, I really wanted to play the cello when I was just a kid like that. I loved the sound of the cello and the low register, you know. Yes. Uh, later, the viola da gamba has that beautiful low register sound in chamber music, you know. And viola would have been possible too, but I didn't do that. I wanted to play. I also, since I got into folk music and blues and stuff when I was pretty young, like 11 and 12, um, I wanted to play a guitar and I wanted to play guitar in school. I, when they asked you, you know, what you want to do. And they said, no, I know we don't have guitar, but we need a trombone player. So I was forced to play. Yeah. The orchestra, the school band was short of trombone. And the guy looked at my lip and he said, yeah, you could play trombone. So I, <laughs> and, but I didn't, I never did learn to read music. I just played, I had a fairly quick ear and I could copy what the guy next to me was playing. That's awesome. I just, I just, uh, That's know. awesome. So I still like trombone, but I've never touched it since I was 12 or something. But <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So, hey, maybe, you know, hey, some, you know, if the time comes again, you get bored, you pick up the trombone again. But I want to, but this has been yeah. great because I got a question here that actually comes from one of my channel users, which sort of touched sure. on a little bit about what you were suggesting about, you know, how songs were chosen. So let me just, his name is Vinyl Animal. His name's Artie. Um, first off, he wants to say Sandy greetings. He's also from Miami. Um, wow. He's a home, hometown boy, finds his bluegrass dreams. He says, having played with both Bill Monroe and Jerry Garcia, who obviously was a huge fan of Bill's music, is there anything you can share about how they both went about choosing their repertoire or yourself even? How much input did other band members, including yourself, have in contributing songs to be played in a concert? But oh yeah open to such <laughs> suggestions thank you well that's no yeah, that's a good question thanks what was his first name again art art bustamante from art. miami vinyl vinyl what yeah vinyl animal productions is vinyl. his youtube channel name that's his handle on the channel vinyl animal that's that's good yeah i'm one of those too even <laughs> though the, behind me here all you can see is cds and the vinyl is over there and out of Yay. the camera range. <laughs> um and jerry was a big vinyl collector you know um actually this i would it's a pretty good question. And I would say very similar, very similar between the two of them. Uh, very open to, to uh, uh, material ideas from, from band members and elsewhere. Bill was, Bill was really that way. And Jerry, sure. I, when they, when, uh, when we first started playing, when I first started playing in the Black Mountain Boys, I was kind of into this group called the Country Gentlemen and uh, they were a Washington DC band. <clears throat> and, and uh, Jerry, I don't know if he'd really known about them, but I, after I gave him the records or whatever, he totally gobbled it up and was totally into them and, and started to play banjo like their banjo player. And uh, I wanted to play guitar like their guitar player. And their repertoire, uh, they had songs. Jerry got into a couple of their songs on his own, but then I also said there was a song called Two Little Boys, which oh. I, uh, I didn't really know Tiff at that time, but I, I knew Jerry had a brother, you know, and I would, this is a song, this is an old Civil War song about two, two brothers who go off to war and one of them's killed on a horse in this long story saga. And Jerry got in, Jerry liked that and got into that. And we always sang two little boys together. In fact, one of the last times I ever spoke with Jerry out in front, out in front of front street in his car, I said, you know, we should record that two little boys sometime. This is long after the Jerry Garcia acoustic band. He said, you got it. We got to do that. And of course it never happened because that was pretty late in the game. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I would say I would say just about equal. Bill, I uh, remember one time at um, at uh, his park at Bean Blossom there again before the festivals was in between sets and he was out in the side yard and there was a guy named Peter Aceves was his original name but he changed it now I can't think of the name he changed it to. Um, another uh, Latino uh, name. Um, Maybe his original name. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. But anyway, he was kind of a Bob Dylan esque folk guy. I think he may have written songs, and he was very, very, uh, um, very much in that 
I don't want to say he was like Dylan, but he was at the same time. He was one of those kind of guys, you know, singer, songwriter, very good guitar player. He was out there in the side yard and it wasn't a place where people were playing, but he was. He had his guitar out there and he was singing uh, Keep Your Hand on the Plow, Hold On, which is an old gospel song. Um, and Bill, dressed in his stage clothes and everything, was just standing there watching. And he would always watch people who played and often join in with people who were picking out in the field there at Beanbus. But he didn't play this time, but he watched him and he, and he talked to him afterwards. He said he wanted to get the words to that and he wanted to start singing that. This is a guy not even in the band or not. He never even knew who he was. So Bill was wide open for ideas and, and songs um, wherever he might find them. Certainly Jerry, yeah. yeah but Jerry, well, there wasn't much you could, there wasn't much you could show Jerry that he didn't already know. When he was interesting. Singing. Yeah. That's so. cool. Thank you. That's that's really good insight. I mean, and then you basically touched on it a little bit, but so then how did the Jerry Garcia acoustic band come along? Obviously, there were I mean, you were still probably friends over the years, but you know, the Grateful Band, the Jerry Garcia band's going on, and they're like in full force by this time. So, like, how yeah. did that how did that, you know, sort of how did that come back around? Was it Jerry's, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to play that music again, reconnecting with you or yourself? Or how so yeah. and what was that experience like when that eventually came back around? Because wow, you, know, you guys had a bunch of tours together. It was a great experience. Well, I wish we'd done a bunch. We we just did a few, but uh, yeah. <laughs> some things came along and, and kind of uh, circumvented or intervened or whatever. But, uh, um, you know, let's see, in 1986, the year Jerry had his um, uh, diabetic coma, uh, I was living in, I was, I lived in Japan for most of 1986. That's a whole other story. I have a long connection with Japan and Japanese culture. And um, I was there in 1986, and I knew a few deadheads over there. I already, already had met a few uh, Japanese deadheads, and one of them told me, this woman named Yuko, who I still know, Yuko told me that uh, she'd heard Jerry was in the hospital. And I you know, what happened? And I didn't know much about it. So I got in touch with somebody back there and um, found out, a sketch of what had happened and I was you know very concerned about it and I wasn't I wasn't completely ready to come back I was I was planning to stay another month or two at that point but I did come back I just it, wanting to check in with Jerry was part of it yeah I was kind of ready to come back anyway but but um so I I got in touch with with them after getting back and talked to uh mountain girl on the phone and she said well you your timing you know, Jerry was just released from the hospital you know he's here at home and and I think it'd be great if you and you or you and David came over and uh you know bring your instruments and play a little bit and see if Jerry can play because he was he was in that time when he had just started a few days earlier I think uh working with Merle with yeah. Merle yeah to get get his uh, music chops back and yeah. guitar and yeah Tony touched upon that in our conversation I'm a little sure bit too Tony, Tony right there but yeah, oh yeah please. I'm sure he did yeah so we went over, went over there. She invited us for dinner. Went over there and she served a big dinner and the girls were all there. And um, so let's play, let's pick. You know, and Jerry, uh, Jerry first got the banjo out because we figured, we figured we'd probably just be the Black Mountain Boys again. You know, it's just a, we'd be a, I mean, we weren't thinking about a band or anything. We oh, just it's reminiscing. That, You're in the that, moment, well, having fun. Well, yeah. I mean, that night, that night, you know, let's be the Black Mountain Boys again. You know, Jerry play the guitar or play the banjo. And he, he did play the banjo for most of the night and was remarkably together on it. And my, the thing that really blew me away is that he remembered the words to songs that we used to forget way back then. We had, there's this one song, the Stanley Brothers song called Little Glass of Wine. Mm -hmm. It's got about five verses and, and uh, it's hard, it was always hard for us to remember the order of those verses or even, or even the verses themselves. Even back then when we were, um, you know, 17 and 19 or whatever. But that night after dinner, when we were in the living room at Jerry's place, he remembered them all in the right order. Yeah. I don't know what, hap what happened. Yeah, it was just like bizarre. Uh, so that's, that's how that came back together again. And then, and then we were over, I think it was maybe a different time. We were doing the same thing, playing a little bit. Oh, yeah, we played the uh, <clears throat> uh, Thanksgiving party, Grateful Dead Thanksgiving party at the log cabin. There's a Yep. There's a YouTube. Um, well, actually, I saw, I, I spoke with Susanna Millman and she did some of the oh. photography for that. So I got to oh. see that firsthand knowledge of that as well. Okay. Yeah. 
Was she there at the at the log cabin that night? I believe so. Yeah, yeah because she has the photo chip. So. There are some pictures from that. Yeah. Probably. So yeah, yeah. There were a lot of people there who weren't necessarily in the office staff at that time. Like Dan Healy was there, you know. Um, but uh, um, Jerry said at one point, either there or at his house, he's. I remember him saying, "Hey, you know, we can make some folding money with this." And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, whatever, if you want to, you know. And so it was a, some weeks after that, maybe not very long. I got a call from Jerry, and he said. I don't know if there's any money here, but he said, but I'm playing this uh, uh, artist benefit, uh, art, poster artist benefit. You know those guys yeah. that, um, who had, were on hard times in one way or another and needed some money to put together. And so Bill Graham would put on this little thing at the Fillmore, artist art benefit, art poster artist benefit. You know, and Jerry was just going to do it with John Kahn, and um, who I didn't know yet at the time. And he said, why don't you and David come and we'll just do it? We'll just do it the four of us. Okay, no rehearsal, no nothing, just show up, you know, so, so we did that, and that was the first, that was really the first time we played out anywhere with the four of us, we didn't know we were going to do that, and you probably heard that story, David Nelson tells it a lot about uh, Bill Graham came running in the back room afterwards and saying, I got to do something with this, that's the roots of your, you tell Jerry, you know, that's the roots of your music, I, I want to do something with this, and, and Jerry, who was never short on quick retorts and fast on the uptake, said, Hey, well, uh, take us to Broadway, Bill. You know, and, and as David tells the story, Bill Graham walked out of the back room, scratching his head, saying, Broadway, Broadway. And I, I don't know. I didn't see Bill do that, but it, it makes a good story. Oh, no, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the story, right? Yeah, pretty much. And then we, we did get together a few more times before the Broadway thing happened. But, but that art benefit was the first time. Very yeah. cool. And I, and I remember you mentioning to me once, I think it was an email somewhere where it was only supposed to be without a drummer. And then I believe David Kemper oh, yeah. at some point became part of it. And then when you guys did another tour afterwards, it was without the drummer. Um, I mean, again, not, not, no big deal. Just wanted to re recap that for a second because I thought that yeah, was very interesting. Good. Yeah. Well, I think when we played the um, Stanford, that Palo Alto gig at, uh, what's the name of that place there that everybody goes to? Anyway. Uh, Huh? No, not I mean, the outdoors. It was out in Stanford. Uh, Frost. Fro the Frost Amphitheater. Frost. When we played there, I think we just played a quartet, even though I, Kemper was probably there because I think he was there to play with the, uh, you know, the Jerry Garcia band. Yeah. JGB. But he didn't play with us there and a couple of other ones. And we kind of like, I mean, we kind of were thinking of it as a more open, old timey sound without having the rigid the timekeeping of a drum yeah but after he played but after he what happened was i think he at the broadway when we were out doing the broadway thing the broadway thing did happen and, and that in answer, in answer to your question what was it like to do that that was that was just the gig of a lifetime for me the experience of a lifetime for jerry it was you know he was pretty much accustomed to playing real nice rooms and big places and all that but this room was like you know, the, the Lundfontein Theater was, you, you didn't even hardly, you hardly needed a sound system. I, mean, I think Carnegie Hall is probably like that. Yeah. So acoustically perfect, you know, wonderful place. Um, but uh, he, I don't know, David Kemper just sort of, I remember he walked to the back of the stage when we were just getting started and the curtain was about to go up and he just sort of pointed at his drums and, and Jerry said something, uh, Jerry made a motion like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And so he kind of invited himself on and then from that point on, we, he kept doing it. And yeah. it was okay. It was, we like the sound with the drums, you know. It, it kind of, it, it tightens things up in some ways that's, in, in ways that are good. And then it also removes some of the looseness that I like of a non-drum situation, but it was good. Yeah, you, may, hey, you, you do with what you gotta do, right? But then again, you have the opportunity to do without that after a while. So, you know, you yeah. still got that experience of, you know, the free flowingness of it as well. Yeah, um, both of them. All right. I've got uh, Brian Harrell, another question on my channel come out um, here. He's um, actually, can I just touch on one other thing quickly? Because I know we're sort of talking about this. Is it true that you introduced Jerry to David Grisman? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I think a country I, music I, venue in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that, that is true. Because um, I, I had met him the year before in 63 in New York in Washington Square and did some playing with him and knew how how uh, deeply into Bill Monroe he was at that time and Frank Wakefield and what a, you know, incredible mandolin player he was even then at that, at that age. And uh, 
course, his age, you know, realize Jerry's a little bit older than me, and Grisman is too. And so they're, they're probably, I don't know, see, Jerry was born in 42, I think it was. Grisman might have been 43 or something like that, but they're close, you know, closer. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they hit it off pretty well. But I already knew what he could do and who he was. And yeah, I, I remember he was, I, it's, it's a pretty vague memory, but I remember uh, seeing him out there in the field at Sunset Park and taking Jerry over there and saying, oh, this is, yeah, I, I, I did introduce them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's my Look fault. No, yeah. hey, you're full. We're all so honored for that. I mean, there's so many. No, I'm just, awesome just kidding. Things. I know you are. Uh, but there's just so many awesome things that have come from all the different interactions with Jerry and whomever, for that matter. I mean, you know, even with early days of the Jerry Garcia band with Nicky Hopkins or, or you know, any any of the other yeah. keyboards he played with in those earlier years that, you know, you just, wow. And then, you know, obviously he settled in on a bunch uh, of different ones. But it seems even with all the bands, Jerry was always, you know, working through keyboard players, love that specific, you know, addition to his sound or whatnot. And so right. that's, who's, you know. Who's that one he had? Uh, Allers? Ozzy Allers. Uh, Ozzy Allers. David Ozzy oh, Allers. Yeah, 80, 79, 80. Well, I, I love some of that stuff. He, he's a wild, wild player. And I, I'm, I'm really a big fan of the JGB at various times, all, at all times, actually. I mean, I got to see them live a lot. Obviously, we played show, we shared the Broadway thing with them. And I got to see them every night. But uh, but I never saw the uh, J early JGB bands, and I wish I had. I've heard, I've really listened to a lot of those uh, recordings with Ozzy Allers and some of the other ones. You know, Jerry, I'll just say this. Uh, off, this is maybe not no. part of that, any question, but... Um, Jerry, and this is certainly true with Melvin, and to some extent, um, you know, other ones too. I guess um, I don't know if you could say it about Merle. Merle was was a strong player, and he was, you know, you heard a lot of Merle when you heard Jerry and Merle. With you heard a lot of you heard a lot of. Um, um, sorry, I just said his name a second ago. Melvin. Melvin. You heard a lot of Melvin too, but Melvin was a beautiful backup player. You know, that's what Jerry first flashed on him was that was as he called it those wonderful little things he plays or something like that. He, Jerry called it. He just, you know, has a way of complimenting and that's with an E of course, uh, <laughs> uh, anything you, you would do and certainly anything Jerry would do. Melvin was just right there with a beautiful chord behind it, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, but Jerry has a way of, uh, you know, being the primary soloist in almost any situation you know, he's going to, you know, if nobody else jumps in, he'll be right there. He's ready to go anytime. Right. But with Ozzy Allers, and I think maybe there were a couple of others, they just climbed all over it, you know, and Jerry backed off and he, and it was a great interaction. I mean, I just love hearing it when, uh, when somebody kind of comes up against him yeah. and, he, and then he does stuff and then he'll, he'll give them space and all that. I like that. You know, I, really I agree. I agree. I think, I mean, I've always said, I think in a way Ozzy subconscious, subconsciously pushed Jerry further, harder yeah. because yeah. Jerry was listening and was so enamored with what was going on. It's like he had to yeah. answer it. And it was like, wow. And exactly. you can, in those 79, 80 years of Jerry, it, it's like a quartet, obviously. And it's like, obviously, yeah. quartets before. But right. I actually call it Pocket Jerry. It's between mm. Merle and Melvin. And, uh -huh. it's like, and it's like, wow, there's just something different going on there. Because, you know, before, before, before Ozzy, it was more bluesy, jazzy, jazzy, obviously, more so. Right. And after right. that, it, Melvin becomes a bit more gospel or more Motown. And it kind of takes a different leg of it. So, or, you know, more That's American, right. even some Canadian with the Bruce Colburn and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the more Canadians in there. But yeah. it's like we, call it, we call it Jukebox Jerry. But I uh, find with those Ozzy years, it was just such good. a different beast. And you can almost hear the rippingness. And then if you take that over to the Grateful Dead, actually, in those right. years, too, that's right where, you know, Brett was transitioning in, Keith was transitioning out. There's a certain different feel there as well. That, and Absolutely. So I'm so glad you brought that up about, the, about Ozzy Ellis because yeah. it's something that I well, actually noticed and brought up with my audience as well. Or the mm -hmm. audience. I like those terms you have for uh, intermediate Jerry. Uh, <laughs> experience. Well, you know, I want to say something about Keith, too, because Keith, there were yeah. times when, when Keith was, uh, I think Keith's, buzzing on my computer uh, no 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 it's not that it's not anybody it's uh something like uh what does it say oh it's just news news clips or something oh so like notifications that. on the computer you're just getting notified yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I, I think you, i'd like to be able to defeat those i don't know how to do that um <laughs> i mean that'll be our next conversation I'll <laughs> okay yeah I don't, need any, I don't need any news i've, I've got enough news um 
you know, when Keith was having a great night, which happens sometimes when he, especially when he was playing, well, he was almost always playing a real piano because he, that's all he could really relate to is a, a beautiful, the beautiful sound of a real piano. There were some times too there where he, he, he was also a wonderful backup mm. player. He was, you know, extremely complimentary player, but he had, he had a great sensibility for some, especially again, some of the gospel songs when they were in the JGB, when, they were doing some of the things that he and Dono brought to the band, yes. you know, brought to the JGB. And, but even in The Grateful Dead, sometimes Keith would just lay into those heavy chords on the piano and it would be up there in the, in the mix pretty well. And you could tell that Jerry was really relating to that too. He really, you know, he, I don't want to say backed off, but he, yeah, he did some, but he, he worked with it. You know, he worked so beautifully with Keith's uh, you know, semi-classical, you know, these very rich, lush chords that he would yeah. play chordal melody chord melody you know he was a master of chord melody which is a thing for sure you could actually hear a lot of that in 75 because obviously no dead we had the don and keith band came out for a bit right the keith and donna band yeah. and then jerry sat right. in with that and that yeah. you can kind of hear a bit more you know because keith and don are more the forefront so the music's different and jerry's sort of not playing a back role to that but playing a more complimentary, but then also leading exactly. the same time. That's and the same. You, you can kind of, exactly, you can kind of hear that there more so with we're the Grateful Dead. It's obviously, you know, Bobby, you know, Bobby Phil drums is a little more going on all the time. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that you have that same kind of, you know, perception of it as well, because it's something that we've talked about on my channel. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's only a few years of JGB with, you know, Donna and Keith, you know, 77, right. 76, 77, 78, mostly a little bit of 79. Uh -huh. uh, but that's not the big, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's a different time. And it's really an interesting period because you hear it, you hear a different style in those couple of years with Keith and Donna that you don't necessarily hear prior mm -hmm. to that or after that. And it's not, right. not, not good or bad. I'm not suggesting one way or the other. No, it's, it's just interesting. It's, exactly. Yeah. It's the, the Jerry journey, right? If we could speak that again, knowing yeah. that he came from a banjo and, you know, I, even when Dennis or whoever was told me, I think it may have been Susanna. After a while, he, she actually said one of the guitar, one of the things he didn't like, the, he liked the least was actually playing an acoustic guitar. Mm hmm until later with Grisman, where he really got into it more and said, you know, Dennis or Susanna said he really loved playing with Grisman, the acoustic guitar. But before that, it wasn't his favorite necessarily instrument. And so hearing all these different things and hearing your perspective on it has been really cool and interesting. And this is kind of why I wanted to have this, because it's 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 direct but indirect at the same mm -hmm. time. And I kind yeah, of like sure. that opinion of it, sure. right? As, uh, by the way, he, of course, he played uh, what we called almost acoustic guitar on on in the JGAB, you know, um, he didn't play a real high quality guitar. He, he liked that guitar, but he played these, he, he would, he, he played a, a fairly inexpensive Takamine um, guitar with the, with the uh, pickup on it and all that. Um, Paezo pickup, I think they're called, style of, of the sound. And I, I thought, and a lot of people thought it had a kind of a, I mean, I hate to use the word nasty, but it had a kind of a, Slightly Grungy. annoying, Grungy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly annoying tone, and it was he kind of liked, you know. <laughs> I mean, he was he he liked the snappy quality it had, you know. I don't think the action was adjusted all that well, you know, and he didn't have it set up all that well. Not like more he was raw. set up. It was his, more raw for like, him, I think. He more yeah, raw. Yeah. He just play yeah, it right. out, and he could. But he liked it. Right. He made a he made a great sound out of it, you know. Like when you hear him play lead guitar on uh, Irene Goodnight. Or good night, Irene, with the with us, you know. Wow, that thing is just snapping and it's the buzzing and doing all kinds of, you know, what my some people might call bad sounds, but he manages to make them, you know, it's like a uh, it's collage, you know. He makes yeah. he's an artist, you know. He's making an art piece, you know, and he uses whatever he's got. And the reason he liked that particular guitar, he told me, was that I can buy one anywhere if, if, if somebody steals it or I drop it or something like that. I can get one off the wall in any music store in any town anywhere. I don't want to carry around a, a vintage wonderful guitar you know he made that decision now with Grisman, i don't think Grisman would allow him to play that 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 takamina you know he put a he put an expensive guitar in his hands right away and kept on doing that you know different kinds of expensive guitars sure <laughs> well, yeah he wanted yeah. a little bit more different kind of sound that chris well, obviously wanted to curate not necessarily in that yeah. word but no 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 that's a good word for it and i think he was good at he he knew what jerry would you know he knew who jerry would sound great on uh, an old Gibson uh, L5 or whatever, a really good old Martin or whatever he put in his hands. You know? He's a collector. And he's got all kinds of instruments, you know. But uh, Jerry 
on his own would not have, have gone that direction. But uh, yeah, sure. I'll, uh, he, you know, he was acquiescent and, and uh, back to the word we used or I used in the very beginning, a mediator. Somebody yeah. wanted him to do something or suggested he do this or that. Sure, I'll try that. You know, he was uh, he was an easy guy, you know. He was, seemed like it. I mean, yeah. he, he gave us all so much. I mean, regardless, I mean, yeah. almost without even trying, you know, it, it was just yeah. him being him ended uh, up you know, with all these wonderful things. Right. Well, and I was a big fan of the uh, of the JGB when they and they would play the. You mentioned Keystone Palo Alto. They played Keystone Berkeley a lot too. Yeah. And I was I was living there in the, at that time and would pop in there every now and then and hear them. And I, I again I wasn't really familiar with the material that well. Now I'm much more familiar with the JGB, having especially having heard, heard them live a lot. I knew the repertoire pretty well. But at that time, I used to go to the there and again just sort of stare at Jerry and listen to what was coming out of the guitar. Probably, and John was there. I didn't really notice what, what his bass style was like. I didn't know that what that was like until I played with John. And such a remarkable, I didn't really know what Jerry saw in him or, or was attracted to in his style, you know, because I thought he was playing, in those days, I used to think, well, he's kind of like playing, it's as if he's playing a lead guitar. And, I, and people say that about, you ever heard anybody say that about Phil Lesh? I've heard yes. that said. Sounds like he's playing a lot of lead guitar. Well, that's not what's going on. He's playing lots of counterpoint and all kinds of ideas. And, you know, it's it's not some guitar soloist. No, that's not what either Phil or John did. But John had a, a rhythmic sense that was really unique. Uh, I don't want to modify unique. It was just unique. No, you're right. And hence, <laughs> hence where the conisms come from, right? Like we've got all the words, yeah. like anything with yeah. a C-O-N, we like contact. <laughs> we're having, when we hear a bass solo during, we're, we're having convulsions, you know? Convulsions. Yeah. So we really take in that to That's a whole other great. level because, Love you know that. what I mean? It's like, it's like we're having con bombs, you know, and he's just <laughs> going in them. There's been a few shows we brought yeah. Tony up and Tony was always about, I'm going to match exactly what he did. And it's like, yeah. And so there's a, there's a different allure there because of that. Absolutely. Even with the Jerry John acoustic shows, I mean, sometimes John yeah. just let go and let it rip and you heard a totally different dynamic than you necessarily would hear, you know, previously in a JGB show per se. Um, and so very interesting, very cool, like concept and during hearing your perspective on it, because that's definitely how oh, so. I felt about yeah. it for the most part. You said the word concept. Yes, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. It's, it's but, a contest. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he would play a note you wouldn't. Nobody else would think of. So, totally, totally out of his uh, imagination. You know, very, very complimentary musician. A big, big loss. Yeah. John or Jerry, and then John. Jeez. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, and those two again. I mean, almost more of a connection in some ways. Because, you know, I mean, I've obviously heard the stories that were, you know, Jerry considered, you know, JGB his, his fun. And, you know, over time, I guess the Grateful Dead became sort of a job, you know what I mean? And, and that relationship with the different musicians and that's sort of the stories I've heard over time. Um, question from Brian Hill, just to pivot a little bit. Uh, I've got another question here. Um, he says, great opportunity to me. Uh, many thanks, Sandy. What a pleasure and thanks for all your contributions. Um, what advice or approach to learning how to play and create music? provided the best breakthroughs or advancements in your playing. So again, what advice or approach to learning how to play and create music provided the best breakthroughs in your advancement in your playing and who gave the advice or how was the knowledge acquired? I'm well, that's, that's not an easy one. I'm trying to understand exactly where it comes from or, or where it, it wants to go. I mean, um, Maybe could you ask it again? I'll see if I can. Yeah. What advice or approach to learning how to play and create music provided the best breakthroughs yeah. or advancement mm. in your playing? You know, it, it kind of presupposes uh, maybe a, uh, a studiousness that maybe I don't have or never had. Maybe I'm not sure. Um, you know, what I, I used to give banjo lessons once in a while, and what, what I always told students was the most important thing is listening get it in your head in your body listen a lot you know that's probably more important than even playing practicing if i had to say one was more important yeah I'll, i mean you kind of have to say playing is important because that's what you're you're pointed sure. to but, but listening for, for as far as the learning thing um i just was just i mean i i don't 
um, I don't really know music technically that well. I don't, uh, I'm not, a, a, you know, an educated music person, but I do, I have done a lot of listening, I, you know, so I think probably the, I'm not sure if I know, if I know the term to use for his, his question. Um, but the, the big, the biggest thing is just to get it inside of you. I think, you know, eventually feel it, embody it, feel it, embody it first and then let it expand from there kind of thing. Yeah, as I I recently heard somebody say, uh, if you play this stuff long enough, some some of it's bound to leak out. <laughs> you know, I, or if you listen to this stuff long enough, some of this some of it's bound to leak out. You know, um, I don't know if I if I'm answering if I'm getting to the yeah, root. Of it's okay. His, uh, yeah, but that's an interesting. Uh, maybe he's thinking a little more technically. Uh, Possibly. You know, certainly. Um, I mean, in the in the realm of playing a lot. Um, what do you do? You, you know, playing, playing is something, <clears throat> unless you're learning sheet music or written music, which is something Jerry did get into eventually, you know, through, uh, 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 well, yeah, at the, at the time he started learning again. Um, but not with Merle, yeah, in 86. With Merle, yeah, not Melvin, but Merle, yeah. Merle got him into official music a little more, you know. Um, but I think what we used to talk about things like when you're playing, you know, just improvising, you'll do something you had, you hear yourself do something you hadn't done before, or you don't really know what it is. So then take that and, and work with it. Build just learning. From, so you're learning from yourself, basically, you know, you're, that's, you're, and that's the second question was who gave the advice or how was the knowledge acquired? And so in this situation, because you were the player mm -hmm. more than the educated learner that way, regardless, no. right? It yeah. was more trial and error. Learn, play. What did you like? How did it make you feel? Build right. on that. Take away That's from right. that sort of thing. Correct, right? So more, exactly. more Those... natural, raw, yeah. kind of like Jerry, in terms of, you know, where I, I have friends that are musicians, obviously, and, you know, they they studied it in school, and then they from there it comes out, or that may even, you know, guide how they write music because they're using their education as opposed to, or and or feeling mm. as their basis versus it coming just from a place of passion or just, playing it out and figuring out what works, right? So I'm not saying sure. that doesn't occur in that process, but there's obviously a bit of a different way when it's sort of, you know, organic. Let's call it organic as opposed to it being a structured learning thing where you're yeah. trying to incorporate that into everything versus let's just play, see what happens. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Something new. Yeah, but also also pay attention. It's, it's yeah, let's just play, but not, not completely. I mean, you can go completely, uh, you know, just play and play and not even really pay much attention to what you're doing. But if you want to progress... In that particular improvisational way, I think it's important to, you know, if you hear, especially if you hear yourself doing or you see yourself doing something that you kind of like, you didn't, you didn't plan on it, you don't really know where this is coming from. But oh well, uh, if I can do that, maybe I can do this, and maybe I can do that. How about if I do it in this key? And you know, you you you're you're teaching yourself from what you're doing. But there's something else to say, which is again back to the listening, but also there's a visual component. And back mm -hmm. in those days, we we used to, I mean. In the South, they call it finger watching. You know, you get a lot of, uh, in fact, a lot of old time musicians didn't like people to watch their, I've only heard about this. They would turn their back, fiddlers would turn their back. And I've seen, I've seen little bits of this and, and try to keep it, keep, because it's their style they had figured out. They didn't want, even didn't want people to see what they were doing, you know. But, but when I came along, by the time I came along in the 60s, everybody was, uh, I mean, there were there was some restriction about taping. Now we some some of the bluegrass band leaders didn't like to get taped. Bill Monroe was fine with it. He never objected to being taped. But Jimmy Martin, I don't know if you ever heard that name. He was one who didn't particularly want to be taped. And maybe the Osborne brothers weren't crazy about it either. Our record company told us, uh, you know, it's better to not have people tape your stuff. And I don't know why, but but Bill was totally open open to it. But and Jerry, watching, yeah. But watching is, you know, one of the reasons we liked to uh, go to clubs. I, I, in fact, that night, that first night when Jerry and I saw the Osborne Brothers at that little club in, in Ohio, in Dayton, you know, we get we get up there really close to the state, up close to these guys and watch them. What is Bobby actually doing on the mandolin? What is Sonny actually doing? You know, that's one of the reasons you wanted to go see these people. And there was no audience. I mean, we, we were the audience. It was yeah. there, like, 
maybe there were nine or 10 other people in there that night, you know, but we could watch them really clearly. And, and watching other musicians not in performance situations too. If you're jamming together with people, you'll watch what their fingers are doing, you know, and that's a way of learning too, you know, but it's so visual, it's like, and now of course with videos and, and YouTube, and you know, people have the opportunity to, <clears throat> you know, expand that, that, that window and watch really close. You can watch what Jerry's doing, you know? I was watching, I was watching a, uh, do you know that little trick that Jerry used to do where he'd hold the pick in his stump? No. And he, uh, you know, have you ever watched him play um, finger picking and then suddenly he turns, he changes and he, he starts flat picking? Yeah. Without, picking. yeah. So he would, what it was is he'd, he'd keep his flat pick stuck in there. It was just in there. And he would, and he was expert at dropping it. He would oh. drop it and he'd catch it with his finger. And in an instant, he would switch between finger style and, and flat pick style. And I never saw this live, but I saw it on YouTube. Ah. I saw it, on, it was a concert where, you know, oh, that's how he's doing that. You know, it's amazing. I just never know. He, he was so deft at it. I mean, he did it so imperceptibly that you could yeah. hardly see it. But really if it, cool. with, with the video, you go back. 10 times to watch oh is he really doing that but live you can't it's too fast and he was so good at yeah. it really cool and that's interesting because i i love watching the fingers going like that for me yeah. is as much as i enjoy the music the music takes me away i mean i'm not gonna lie sometimes music can be a little take me like take me to a place where, okay i've had enough like but that extra added visual of the player going and that enamors me in a different way and then I connect the finger playing and the movement with the sound. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm even more engaged with it mm -hmm. for other people. It's just, they just happen with the music or they're like the lyrics or something sure. else brings them in. For me, it's, I really love that. I'd rather, this is, a, I'd rather see, you know, a keyboardist go crazy or a guitarist mm -hmm. or a drummer go nuts than just a mm -hmm. standard, you know, beat or whatever, because mm -hmm. that to me, not being a musician myself um, and not really having that talent at all it actually, it really opens my eyes and it really excites me in some way. So, and then to feel, and then to hear and feel the music that comes out of that is also mm. something that's really amazing to me, which is, you know, sort of why the acoustic music, I mean, for myself personally, I mean, with my friends that are local musicians and Jerry, obviously in the acoustic band, it's developed a much more feel and understanding for this kind of music where I'd rather go see a bluegrass band or player that I've never seen before because I might learn something new than see a band I've seen before because I've already kind of seen it and, you know, what I know what to expect. And so it's kind of changed my perception a bit of, you know, how I kind of consume music now and that I really, really enjoy that, you know, more dynamics, more layers, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and that sort of, you know, to that point of, about, about the different things with the, you know, Jerry, even with the banjo or yourself, you know, the different styles and the different things that those fingers sometimes for me become part of that experience for me and watching that and seeing the connection between those two things. Really cool. Sure. Yeah. Well, when I was pretty young, I used to watch the bands around here or what few that we had around here. And there was one musician named Pete Berg and Pete played in, uh, he was an early Redwood Canyon Ramblers member, but he also played in a group called uh, the Ridge Runners. And uh, he was a banjo. Well, he played banjo, but he plays everything. He's, now he's a Latin jazz guitarist, I think, or now or 10, 20 years ago he was. He's always reinventing himself. But he, when he was playing banjo around here, he had the most elegant left hand. He had, he, he had the least amount of motion in his left hand. It was like almost it wasn't moving. The fingers wow. were almost not moving. How does he do that? And I used to watch him and think, and I think I picked up a little of that. I, I think you can, I'm not like him, but, but um, I'm actually left-handed. I don't, I don't play left-handed, but my left hand is stronger than my right hand. Me too. And, uh, ah, okay. Well, there you go. And you did play music. You were a viola. So you, you, you do have a little tiny bit of connection to that when that watching thing, you, you've done it. So you kind of know how to watch it too. Yeah. Let me remind you. But, um, <laughs> But uh, I picked that up from Pete, and Jerry told me that he got it from me. I don't know if that's true or not. He never told anybody else that, probably. But well, sure he told he me got it. I believe he that. Told me that. He told me he got a few things from my, my uh, teenage guitar playing, and that was one of them. You know, he, he liked my playing back then, and, and, uh, and uh, I think he could see I'd picked up a couple of technical things, like this uh, very economical left hand motion and Jerry's Jerry got it right away and became a master at economical motion with all of his 
with both both sides, left and right. No doubt, no doubt. Like, letting I know the amount, the, and, the, the amount he could do with that flat pick, you know, uh, pretty just amazing. totally unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing. Well, I've got a couple more, like just a couple things I want to touch on. So this is a weird question, not weird. My, it's my sound man, like not my sound man, but he's for the bands mm -hmm. I work with locally. He helps me with my channel in terms of when I do live streams, he makes the streams better. He has the best question ever. He asks it every single time to every single person I interview or have a conversation yeah. with. He wants to know, what are your preferred pizza toppings? <laughs> Somebody used to ask Clarence White whether he slept in the nude. Um, <laughs> I'm not asking you that. No. <laughs> um, you know, what's funny about, about me and Pete. Pizza. Uh, okay, I don't prefer the West Coast pineapple, everything sort of kind of piece. But I, I am, I'm an old ex macro. You know, I used to follow macrobiotics pretty much, and I don't much anymore. I'm a slipped. I'm a, I'm a what do you call it when you slipped and slide it off? Uh, anyway, uh, but I don't care for I don't care for white flour products very much. Oh. So pizza dough. Now, when I lived in Chico, California, there was a pizza place up there that was uh, that made their they made their crust out of about fifty to sixty percent whole wheat flour, mm. and the rest was white flour because white flour is, is is a good foil for flavors. It doesn't have much flavor of its own. Whole wheat flour has a little more flavor, and it could interfere yep. with with a pizza. But they put just enough in there to make it really tasty make the crust really tasty and I, I could really get into that as far as toppings I mean back then when I was living in Chico I wasn't eating much too much meat so I wasn't I was more into or not too much cheese either and I was, so I was eating more into uh, there's a there's a thing called um, oh what is it called it's a French style there's it's, it's actually the French style of pizza it's called pizza 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 it's a word that sounds a little like pizza Pizza, but it's a French word. Pizza la terre. It's this, it, and the toppings are almost all vegetables. Pizza from the earth, because yeah, pizza la terre. Yeah. Terre is earth in French, so that that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. That's, I'm not saying it right. I used to know it. Really ah, well. okay. But, but it's basically what you end up with: roasted vegetables, and if you've got a cheese uh, under, if you've got cheese under that, then there's that. But a lot of what you have is is you know probably every kind of vegetable, any kind brushed with a little olive oil mm. and garlic's on there and plenty of flavor and baked and, and roasted like that. But I no now, I mean, if I had, see, I don't eat it very often because I really don't like eating white flour products. So I, I usually pass on pizza. Fair enough. But fair enough. I can, I like any kind of pizza toppings. I, I, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm omnivorous about pizza toppings. Maybe I don't have a favorite. Um, that's yeah. it. There's your answer. I, I practice yeah. mindfulness, and we're taught in mindfulness that no feeling is still a feeling. Uh huh. And, and yeah. make, not making a choice is still making a choice. Sure. So, great answer. No, that's perfect. Well, that's it. It's, it's, it's a fun it's also, question. It's, yeah, no, it's a fun question. It's, it's also not so much not making a choice, but being happy with any choice. You know, there's nothing, I'm, I'm omnivorous, so there's nothing they can put in front of me that I wouldn't eat. Now, nowadays, you know, <laughs> no, probably, well, even back then I would eat a little bit, but not very much. But now I'd probably gobble up quite a bit. But um, but if somebody would make a pizza with, uh, I think it used to be called pizza saladier. Yeah, pizza, pizza saladier. If, uh, there was this friend of mine who was Jacques Delongre. He made a wonderful pizza saladier. And, and, but he made his with 100% whole wheat flour, but it was whole wheat flour that he ground. He ground himself, so it was very live. And it would, because if you're using... If you're using whole grain flour and you grind it, you grind it and you bake with it right then, it has a lot more life to it. Mm. And if you can do natural levain, you can make a levain, you know, it'll, it'll leaven by itself without yeast. Ah, you know, the mean. word leaven, here we go. There we yeah. go. Cooking yeah. tips with Sandy Rothman, ladies ah. and gentlemen. <laughs> We could go there. Well, he asked about pizza toppings. Oh, no, it's great. It's yeah. perfect. Oh, that's no. a great. That's a great question, though. It's great. Yeah, of course. Corey's the best. Corey's. I love. Uh, Corey's like you know twenty whatever years younger than me, and I love him like a brother. And he's actually in the band. It's a band called the Lizards. We're a fish tribute band. A lot of the guys in the band. Oh. Corey's the youngest, but I actually feel Corey's the oldest. Uh -huh. He just has that certain side to him where he's like always responsible, making sure no one's causing problems. And 
Corey, I Corey's the best that way. He's like the, the old man with a young heart and vice versa, whatever. But a little bit um, like Jerry. A little bit like Jerry. We used to say it was such an unbelievable shame that Jerry only lived to 53, but but then somebody would say, Yeah, about 153. Yeah. Because he was so mature in so many ways, you know. And it goes back to again that idea of being the mediator type guy. He was always that way. He was he was so uh well, he was just so ahead of himself, you know. I mean, when we used to play at the Tangent, he was probably only 20 then. But his, if you ever heard his MC work that he would used to do, have you heard no. live tapes? Of, no. You heard live Black Mountain Boys tapes? Yes, yeah, so, okay. So, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, okay. So, he, would, he would talk in between songs, you yeah. know. Well, the stuff he said was always... I mean, if you used it today, it was like it would be like a script. It would be like somebody somebody wrote a stand-up script mm. for somebody, you know. He was so on top of it all, right. you know, very, very... And, and always able to see every point of view. And I can see why you said he was... Uh, you know, that people used, used to talk to him for, well, if not marital issues, any issues that required care and thought and, you know, mindfulness, basically, you know. That's absolutely. Really, and really I feel good. like... Jerry, in a way, embodied mindfulness without even really knowing what it was because, I mean, his playing in of itself was so in the moment, which most music is anyways, mm -hmm. but that ability to, to be in that moment and for Jerry just to take it wherever based on so many variables that we've already covered, I mean, even yourself or whoever, that's sort of, you know, it's just such a wonderful thing to hear and I really appreciate um, that. So a couple well, things. I got to say, Ian, I got to say, he and I'll just stick this in that he and Tiff were yeah. both nice catholic boys from san francisco you know i mean you're as long as you're going to talk about jewish guys i gotta say because there's a certain training that comes with the catholic school education you know there's i i, I play with a couple of guys these days who were raised that way and and they're very thoughtful and, and kind you know just yeah. naturally that way i mean i'm not saying certain type of awareness certain type of awareness I like certain type of awareness i'm not saying it didn't come from inside jerry's heart and soul that he was probably born with but i think he was raised to and 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 you know i think he learned something from those i think you do learn something from those early educational experiences you know some of those sisters might have been hard on you as a kid but they but it something, something for sure too, for sure know? absolutely you may not attach to it in certain ways no. but you attach to it in other ways where it helps other parts of it. So maybe Jerry wasn't necessarily the most religious person, but those learnings and teachings may have helped with other things that he was doing every day or his passion for music or his commitment to being a certain way, which we obviously hear and feel every day in his music that's right. all around. So you're but right. He was, but he was a little religious too. I mean, I always felt that he, you know, I mean, I don't know if, if a commercial. Well, that's he, didn't, he didn't speak about it as often is what I'm suggesting. He didn't proselytize at all, but he, he definitely, uh, things he would say would come from from a something something close to that i think yeah you know, and again you would know better you're i mean you were his good friend and you guys had a lot okay. of history together and especially at that point so you'd have some, a little bit more knowledge in that as well um, he was probably a little he was probably closer to santa claus than jesus but but he he certainly was jesus like in some ways you know but he loved santa claus and he loved christmas you know it was one of his favorite too and frankenstein of all things right Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Well, he liked anything. To be, he, he liked being scared. And that's something that came from childhood, you know. Yeah. So, so okay. I know that I know that during the pandemic, you haven't had a lot of chance to really play or get together with your boys or whoever or whomever. Um, do you have anything current for yourself that you want to mention or talk about? Anything upcoming? Oh, oh and, well, thanks. And yeah. And how do people find you online? Like if someone needs to find you or get your music or download or shop or buy your stuff? This you know, about used... your promotion right now. So let's hear it, Sandy. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And as far as the latter part of that question, there used to be a website that uh, Steve Marcus made for me, you know, Steve, um, from from uh, Grateful Dead Tickets. Yeah. And Steve made that, but I don't think it's online uh, out there anymore. We decided it wasn't visually, uh, artistically what I wanted, but I don't know. I don't have I don't have a place online to buy anything. I did for a while. Uh for this project that Brian Godshow and I have together, the Banter and Fiddle Project. And I'll mention that, but the best way, the only way really to get it right now, I mean, I think elderly, elderly instruments in, uh, where are they, in Indiana? Oh, where, uh, no, in Michigan. They're in, they're in Ann Arbor or something like that. They have copies of that record, of that CD of uh, mine and Brian's, but the best way is just to uh, email me. I'll send it to anybody. <laughs> I awesome. don't know. I, you know, 
I don't even know how much to ask for it because we're we're not really trying to sell it anymore. We've been, spent a lot of money on it and we never sold much of it. And when time goes after a certain amount of time goes by, you just kind of give stuff away, you know, yeah. or give me 10 like, bucks. It becomes legacy. It becomes legacy at that point. You've already yeah. kind of done what I've, you need to do. It's like, here, listen, take it. I've, give, it. I've given most. Yeah, I've given most of it away. I have a few other CDs, too. Yeah, I wish there was a, a website. I should talk to somebody about that. I'm not good at doing web related stuff myself, but um, we can talk. I can help. Well, well Great. We'll circle back after question? this. We'll circle back after this. We'll talk some emails, have some phone calls. Sure. And I'll see okay. how I can help you any way I can. Absolutely. The first, no there, was the first, there was the first part of that that I didn't respond to. What was it? Um, uh, you, just about your any upcoming projects or tours. Oh, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We actually, you said we, we're not getting together. We didn't for the first, the first COVID year, you know, when everything was locked down. We didn't. But then when, you know, and it wasn't even after the, uh, it wasn't even after the vaccine, but we, there was Certain, it came a certain point, I guess, about a year ago when we just did, or maybe it was last March of this year, we did decide to start getting together again. So we actually play every week. We, we get right. together and play every week. And I really enjoy it. I mean, I was just talking with Butch about that the other day, about not having gigs. You know, it's, we're at this age. I mean, gigs are fun. And it's nice to be able to share music with people and do things out and all that. But also, it's, we've really been enjoying just working on stuff. Yeah. We, we mostly work on three-part harmony. We put a lot more time into, into singing than we do playing. We play, but, but singing is what we're really into a lot. And uh, once again, that group, the Osborne Brothers, are a big, a big um, inspiration for us. Um, their three-part harmony is very special. We've been working on that and some other trio things. And... Uh, yeah, we do a lot of that. Um, we have a little bit of an issue right now because our dear guitar player, Bob Waller, which is brother, broke his shoulder oh. the other day. He got pushed down by a real big dog in a dog park and it broke his shoulder. And so he's going to be out of commission for a while. Yeah, surgery tomorrow. What a feel for Bob. Yeah, wishing, him best, wishing him good health and, 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 you know, and a healthy recovery and speedy Great. recovery as well. And hopefully Great. it all works out so Great. you guys can get back to playing again as soon as possible. Great. Thank you. But also I have my other thing, which is playing with Brian. Um, we, we've been musical partners since uh, about 1990 or so when we made a CD together. And um, I still have copies of that too. <laughs> Give a lot of those away. Uh, but we did this thing, I think, in 2015, um, just banjo and fiddle, no other instruments, just duets between mm -hmm. the two of us. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I still like it. I listen to tracks from it once in a while, and Brian does too. And we, we still, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good if you can still like your old, some of your old Let's stuff. Listen to yourself. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, yeah I, actually, I actually like a few, a few of the tracks quite a bit. So I'd send you one for sure, or... Um, Anybody can get them. I mean, they're they're easy to get. Those I probably should say maybe ten bucks or something because we're still trying to pay for uh, all the work, all the all the money we spent on it. Not that many years ago, but my old CDs, I'll I'll send them to anybody who sends me postage. Yeah. So if anyone <laughs> needs to reach out, get through. Just send me a note on my YouTube channel through That'd comments, and I'm happy to send you Sandy's great. email so you Thanks. can purchase or get any of his music from him, or find out if they do get to play again gigs where he may be in the future with his friends or with whomever and you can go check them out and have a great time with that that audience and have a, and have some bluegrass fun man i mean that's what it's all about and you know hopefully you can get back out and share the music as soon as possible i know you're still having fun not doing that but mm -hmm. again having a bit of that extra you know feeling inside of getting it out there sharing it as well as making it absolutely I'm hoping you get there sooner than later thank you well i appreciate it i would we we would like to Great. Now, the last segment I usually do, this is strictly from my wife, her co-producer. When I was going to meet Don, I was like, I'm not an interview. I don't know what to do. And she came up with a bunch of questions as a sort of a break the ice to get me thinking. So maybe you've heard of the act inside the actor studio. I've heard of, but don't know much. Okay. Well, he used to, at the end of the show, he used to ask a specific set of questions. So there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 of them. And they're quick ones, just like one answer questions, and that'll wrap up the, wrap up our conversation today. I think I told um, you before. I think I told you before. I'm not really great at the at the real fast retort. Oh, you'll love these you, ones. Trust me, you'll be try. okay. You'll be okay. okay. Ready? Here we go. What is your favorite word? <laughs> I think maybe ha ha. Perfect. That's two, those two words. That's, um, ah, but there's a hyphen, so it's one. 
favorite word. Yeah, that, boy, I think I got too many favorite words. And I'm an old ex proofreader and part time editor. I got a lot of words I like. Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of All words right. I like. All right. So then, what is your least favorite word? <laughs> Uh, modifying the word unique like when people say very unique ah. you can't do no that's not a that's not a least favorite word though yeah, not irregardless right not irregardless right? irregardless yeah that's a good one <laughs> that's a good one yeah of course we all grew up with that one yeah I, sure. yeah we still don't like hearing it but yeah i don't have a single least favorite word i don't think uh hate those are good questions oh hate uh, alfred Alfred Arage, a philosopher from the early 20th century, said, never fear to hate the odious. Mm. So that kind of changed my perspective on hate. I probably don't like it in any other way, but I'll take it in that way. Yeah, I think so. All right. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, I, mean, I almost want to say what doesn't. I mean. That's it. I'm, yeah, I mean, everything, especially when, when you separate, when you pull those separately. What are the three again? Spiritually, well, either creatively, spiritually, or emotionally, either all or one, it doesn't matter. Creatively, I mean, I, it's creatively, it's whatever medium, you know, is you're working with or, or is in front of me, you know. Again, like Jerry and like a lot of friend, other friends of ours here in the Bay Area, I had a kind of a fine arts background before I got into music. I thought I was going to go in the painter direction. Mm. And my my uh, big one of my big inspirations, huh? That question's coming in a second. Interesting. <laughs> ah, well, one of my big inspirations in in modern painting is a painter is actually an East Coast painter, but was not, lived on the West Coast named David Park. And David Park is still my favorite. Painter, he passed away in 1950, 1960, so he's not living, but he's, he's a modern, he's mm. a painter of today. You know, I could talk about Vuillard or Bonnard or somebody from a long time ago or anybody else, but uh, David Park, I mean, I'm sitting here just on the other side of my monitor is a David Park poster from a show at SF MoMA, and I, I look at that probably 10 times a day. I, I it just... Um, can't say enough about David Park. It makes so, you feel good. It makes you feel uh, good. Yeah. That's so that's that. that's my creatively in terms of fine arts, musically, creatively, it's it's. I mean, can you be nearly infinite? I mean, it's like you know, I can't. I wouldn't know where to stop. Sure, Bill Monroe and Earl Scruggs and all these other names and and uh, Blind Lemon <laughs> Jefferson. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I, mean, I, I like so much of everything. You know, that's great. Right. That's you want. Yeah. Okay, then what turns you off? I think limit limitation, you know, or, or uh, uh, um, yeah, anybody, anybody, or anything that seeks to, uh, you know, shut down all those qualities you just mentioned before. That's great. That's great. That, turned, that would turn you off. Yeah. That then that's a great answer. And and so we got a few more. What is your favorite curse word? Um, Donald Trump. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Favorite, favorite oh, cuss word. Oh, yeah. Is there one you notice yourself saying all the time? Like, you know, no, it's just, just oh, shit. Oh, yeah, there, you go. there it is. Oh, shit. There we go. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love or makes you just feel feel everything? What sound, sound, or, noise? Or, no sound or noise? Is there a sound or noise that makes you feel like alive and great and mm. wonderful? What's your favorite? Well, I love the sound of snow falling, but we don't get that on the West Coast here, you know. Can I tell you my least favorite sound? That's actually next. What sound or noise do you not like? A leaf, a leaf blower. Oh wow! I don't <laughs> like the leaf blower. I don't like the concept of leaf blow. Leaf blowers, leaf blowers suck. I mean, leaf blowers suck because they don't suck. Ah. They blow. They blow. You know. I mean, they should have a little bag, and it should be collecting the leaves. Don't Great. just move the leaves over to somebody else's yard. You know, I just don't like the concept, and I don't like the sound of it. Well, it's like the worst concept in the world is grass. Is what? Oh, grass. Oh, yeah. We cut what? it. We oh, nurture yeah. it for what? So it can, like, like, it's like, what? What are we doing with grass? Like, what is this? You don't see too much of it in Japan. A lot of rocks and stone, yeah, and a lot of what and a lot of leaves. It's, and, it's and so much they, they, they leave the leaves there. They don't. You know, they don't have a problem with leaves. No, yeah. I agree. Different yeah. culture, absolutely. So what profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? 
What was the, the conjugation of that verb again? What would profession, you have? What profession, would other you than have? your own, would you have liked to have attempted? Would, so, would you have liked to have attempted? Yeah. Well, I guess I should probably say painting because I really, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a painter, but I did a whole lot more drawing than I ever did painting. So I never got, I got that far with painting, but I guess, yeah, to have pursued a career, a pursued art in a way that I didn't, I just took a big heavy left turn into music and art just sort of went by. I still, I still did some of it and I still, I can still draw something, but um, unlike Jerry, I never got back. Jerry got right back into it. Got yeah. really back into it. Um, um, yeah, I guess that. I could probably think of some other things, but not that fast. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more. What profession would you have liked not to have done? <laughs> I'd like not to have invented the leaf blower. Um, uh, see, <laughs> wow, well, from a financial point of view, maybe, but not from the yeah. other point. Of view. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, there would, there would be a lot of those too. There would be a lot of those. I, I, I kind of almost wouldn't know where to start. Fair enough. You know, I'm not crazy about corporate business, but if I'd found myself in that situation and if it was something that I thought was worthwhile, I probably would have gone with it, but probably not. Probably yeah. not. I, I, I like. I like smaller, smaller enterprises better than larger enterprises. Great. All right. This one is kind of cool. I got this. This one's my favorite one of all the ones. If heaven exists, whatever that is to you or what that means in a mainstream, whatever way, I'm not trying to push this <laughs> anyway. What would you like to hear God or whomever's there to greet you say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> That's the last question. That's the last one. <laughs> That's good for a last question. Uh, come on in, I guess. Ah, beautiful. See, Dennis uh, McNally, you know what his answer was? Where's my laminate? <laughs> well, see, that's the kind of good, quick, quip, fast quip. I just can't. That's okay. No, this is okay. You know. no, 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 no. I thank you. I thank you. This that sure awesome. tells you. That sure tells how important the laminate or the cold Grateful Dead ethos is for Dennis, and and I understand that. Yeah, I oh. think I think my buddy Rick Young might say something like that too. Where's my laminate? Yeah, or actually, I already have my laminate. Can I use it? You know? Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, unless you have anything else you want to mention or talk about, Sandy, I just want to say thank you for your time today. It's been great over the last, you know, year or so having these little small emails with you about whatever and sure, anytime and whatnot. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. It's been awesome catching up with you, learning about you, hearing about some of your stories, where you've come from, and you know, just being a part of that, and you know, really jumping into this community a lot more and understanding it from a different angle. And I thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate oh. it. Oh, very much vice versa. I thank you for your interest in your time. And I'm, as far as my background and all that kind of stuff, I about a year ago, I started trying to write a memoir. And I, I have kind of stopped doing it, but I think it'll come back. I'm hoping it'll, if, it, if it does come back again, and if it ever comes somewhere where anybody interested can, can get it, then all those stories will be in there or a bunch of them will, you know. Love it. I'll, I'll send you a copy anyway. I would love to. And, and you know, if that does come around and you do get there, let me know. Reach out. We can okay. do a, another conversation about that and try to promote that. And I can okay. put those <laughs> links up on my channel and help you oh. you know, get out there or sell or whatever. I'm happy to help in any way I can, Sandy. I really oh, nice. It. Very nice of you. Yeah, I'll take, and I'll take you up on the CD thing too. We'll figure out some way to get those mentioned someplace. Absolutely. And I'm happy to be a mediator too. Like if it means I'll collect it and then send it to you. I don't, I'm happy to do it and be in the middleman and try to facilitate anything I can for you to get you out there, get your music, get your legacy going on forever. Cause I really, it means a lot to me. And I appreciate your time today. No, it's great. Great of you, Dave. I really appreciate it. I'd like to come to Ontario sometime. Please. That's yeah. We want you to come up. I got a beautiful home. You're more than welcome to stay with my wife and I, yeah. we don't have kids. We've got a pretty decent sized home. And you know, if yeah. you ever do want to get up here, please give me a call. I'm happy to take you yeah. on a tour, show oh. you around, take you to some music, meet my friends. Oh. We actually have a guy here named Mark Thackaway. He, we call, I call him Canadian Jerry because he Ooh. sort of embodies it. I'll send you a couple of links of him playing on my YouTube channel. Yeah, I'd like to hear it there a little bit too, but He's yeah, it's one, really a wonderful experience. And him and his friend, they now have a band called WS Dupree which uh -huh. is a, sort of a fictional character and they writing uh -huh. songs about that and that's their new band. So 
a lot mm -hmm. of synergies here that I would love to, you know, if you do come, I'd love to introduce you to, and they'd love That's to meet great. you obviously with your history and whatnot. So That's please really cool. do not hesitate, reach out to me anytime you need anything. That I'm happy to wonderful. pick my brain, give you suggestions, ideas, it, you know, give you whatever I can. I'm happy to help Sandy. Oh, that's wonderful. I've, I've um, corresponded with David Lemieux a, a little bit, and I, I happen to love Victoria, where he lives. I've been to that town a few times and just fell in love with it when I was a kid, even. I just always loved Victoria. So maybe I'll start there, and yeah. say hi to Dave, and then somehow figure out a way to get to the other, get to further Please. into Canada. If, if, I've been to Victoria. If you get, if you, when you go to Vancouver, Island, go to Tofino. Oh, okay. Tofino is where you want to go. That's like the big, long beaches. Tempered wow. rainforest behind you, waves. It's just a really special place. I mean, Victoria is the main city, a little bit south of that. Yeah. But Tofino, I've been in this wonderful, wonderful place. It must, so, be, must be great. Okay. All right. Yeah, do yourself a favor. Get up there if you can, you know, as a bucket list item. And please and thank you. Reach yeah. out any time. And thank you for your time again today, Sandy. Thank you for yours. Take care. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.